All right. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we have an exciting session today on building communities of practice. So we're joined by a couple of different organizations who are going to present their experience, and then we'll share a bit from the perspective of the DHS2 global community practice. Um, and I think there's a lot to learn here, and hopefully those of you who are here can, uh, who might be interested in, in building your own communities of practice or engaging in, in ones that exist like ours will have some thoughts for us to share. We might have time for questions, depending on how quickly we get through our presentations. Uh, but first, I'd like to call up our first presenter, joining us from Sri Lanka. Okay, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Ashan Dunugalge from Sri Lanka. Actually, I'm a, a consultant in health informatics, working for Ministry of Health Sri Lanka. I'm attached to uh, the health information unit of the uh, ministry, and I am uh, providing support for all the DHIS2 based health information systems in the country and uh, uh, all the public health information systems. So today I'm uh, talking about uh, Sri Lankan DHIS2 committee of practice, uh, how we started and uh, how we how we are going to sustain that system. So as you all can, all can see, um, DHIS2 journey of Sri Lanka started in uh, 29, 209 as a collaborative project of University of Oslo and University of Colombo and uh, as a biomedical informatics master's program. And then it's gradually scaled up in uh, 2014, we developed some national uh, level implementations and 2016 ERHMIS the aggregate uh, data management system, and uh, 2019, the tracker, COVID-19 immunization tracker, it expand the use of uh, DHIS2 in the country. And currently, we have nearly uh, 13 MSc batches, people who uh, completed the biomedical informatics training so that nearly 250 uh, doctors who trained in uh, health informatics are working in the country, but uh, only 20, uh, nearly 20 of them are actually working in the public health sector. DHIS2 is not only limited to the health uh, ministry of Sri Lanka, actually Ministry of Education also now have come into play. They also have some systems. And uh, Minister of Health also, they have uh, the tracker programs and uh, so many other aggregate data management uh, programs in the place. And uh, we need a community of practice uh, because uh, actually uh, when we think of these systems and all, uh, the health ministry actually, they have more mature systems and they have more uh, experience on managing uh, the DHIS2 based systems. But uh, education ministry actually, uh, they are from IT field, IT background, so that uh, there are more technical people are there. The uh, Minister of Health actually more from medical field. Uh, so uh, to share the, our experiences and uh, uh, as no one knows everything and everyone knows something. We need, needed to uh, net, get network with each other and share our knowledge uh, for the betterment of health. So, as you all know, there are various domains in, in community of practice. Uh, when we talk about the health information system domains and uh, the components of health information systems, actually, the there are some uh, communities working on uh, those components of uh, health information systems and all, but they are more like uh, the user groups, the user support groups they are acting as. And uh, there are four or five user support groups uh, of such a functioning in the country. And uh, uh, functioning in the country. And uh, uh, other than that, actually, uh, we have this, uh, uh, so 
the committee of practice uh, today uh, i'm mainly focusing on are actually at the uh, consist of national level experts and dhis to implementers so that uh, nearly uh, 70 of 70 plus members are actively participate in that committee of practice and uh, And we have several stakeholders, such as uh, his Sri Lanka and academia, especially uh, uh, academics from University of Colombo and government officials from uh, Ministry of Education and Ministry of uh, Health and some technical experts, especially for server management and all. So uh, having this type of community of practice actually uh, giving us so many benefits for organizations, for individuals, and ultimately for all the health information system. Uh, uh, capacity buildings and trainings are now uh, not limited to uh, one health information system or one uh, one component of it, uh, because now uh, when we are planning health information uh, trainings for DHI, DHIS two trainings, actually we are getting feedbacks from committee of practice, and uh, based on their needs, we are uh, doing some training, uh, doing some trainings, so that uh, there is a role for committee of practice in uh, DHIS two capacity building and trainings also, and. Uh, 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 it uh, promotes the peer-to-peer -peer problem solving, developing uh, and verifying best practices, upgrading and distributing knowledge, and uh, uh, fostering ideas and innovations are, we can uh, get through this community of practice. So it helps us to uh, do some uh, actually uh, context sensitive, develop some context sensitive solutions uh, because we are using this community of practice. And uh, uh, as an example, actually, uh, uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, we are uh, our common org unit structures and all uh, we are promoting to use so that uh, data integrations and uh, data integration will be easy when we are doing that. And uh, uh, because we promote good practices, data quality uh, evaluations and everything will be easy and uh, it will uh, meet in the evolving needs in health information system management in the future. And our way forward these two streamline the training programs and uh, uh, we are doing some metadata sharing as i told you before the organic structure sharing we are doing so that uh, uh, the integration will be easy and uh, our data integration actually we are basically focusing on nehr uh, based uh, approach so that the fire standards and all uh, the uh, the community knowing about those things actually uh, it is uh, needed so that uh, the, we are using community of practice to encourage uh, uh, the uh, giving the knowledge on these standards and uh, when uh, talking about resources actually we are uh, providing some templates for the uh, community our community so that uh, when they are developing new systems, they can uh, use those templates. And uh, because of that, uh, the comprehensive documentation for new systems are very easy. And uh, as our community uh, are from various, uh, various fields, uh, there are so many opportunities for them, learning opportunities and uh, other opportunities uh, they can get. Uh, 
from this community of practice. So um, I think this uh, community of practice model for optimize is a good model for optimizing the health information systems, emphasize on collaboration, adaptability, and stakeholder empowerment. And um, as it is tailoring solutions to specific country needs for long-term success and sustainability. Uh, uh, okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Vlad Shioshvili. I'm a technical lead in the data exchange and interoperability group within PEPFAR systems. Uh, I hope everyone is familiar with what PEPFAR is. And, you know, it's a, one of the beasts of DHS2 users. You know, we have a, one of the larger instances and uh, data exchange is one of the key aspects of it. Um, but obviously, we're going to talk about less technical and more community-related stuff because you know we have many users, and you need to support the users. And supporting users means you know building the community. And how do we um, support them to make sure that they have all their needs met? And as the previous um, speaker mentioned, you know community is important. Um, I know the conversation was about community of practice specifically in DHS two context. Ours is going to be slightly more generic, and but it is uh, a specific context in our case. So, you know, we're talking about a system that has uh, many key stakeholders. We have U.S. government on one side with the various uh, U.S. Uh, agencies that are donors in this endeavor, but we also have partners, ministers of health, and um, people on the other side who need to report the data to a DHS two system. And there's a lot of data to deal with. There's a lot of um, uh, processes to follow and just uh, sending them uh, some document that outlines that is not always the best solution and uh, having some kind of interactive uh, community where they can voice their opinions and all that stuff is important. So uh, why community matters? And it's probably, it might not be something new to you, but uh, uh, it's really about driving innovation. When you have many people, they can share their information and uh, Sri Lanka uh, mentioned that you know not everyone knows everything, and you know everyone knows something, and uh, that uh, helps us col build collaborative uh, environment where um, people can uh, solve problems and bring their solutions as well as their uh, questions, so that others can uh, answer those. Uh, and then having this environment helps us build a stronger community that helps everyone in the process to reach the goal. So uh, we have two cases, um, you know, PEPFAR is large. We have many, many different communities. Um, I'm going to specifically talk about the data import implementers community, as we call it. Uh, it's a very focused uh, community about specific goal in mind, which is how to you get your MER and SIMS and all other data that PEPFAR requests from um, its stakeholders into DHS2 environment. Um, and then the second one is the data use community. The, that one is a global community uh, which is open to anyone and everyone, and it's really about sharing uh, thoughts about how do we improve health care uh, data use and uh, it's really an online meeting platform um, we are in a post-covid uh, world where face-to-face -face meetings are rarer and rarer you know something like this where we are today is not often so uh, we have to accommodate the virtual world and uh, it makes it easy to bring together uh, people from different countries uh, and have the sharing um, opportunities for them. So um, what makes uh, information dissemination effective, right? Having a dedicated forum. Uh, in our case, uh, we have a platform which is a wiki style um, page where we take notes, we share information so that people can later come and check it out. Um, we have Q&A sessions and discussions uh, so that people can exchange uh, their ideas. Uh, when you have someone bring in some question or an idea, it's good to contribute, uh, um, highlight them and recognize them so that they feel valued in the process. Um, webinars and meetings, uh, that are recorded and shared later are uh, easy to use because in PEPFAR, we 
deal with countries that are all over the world. We have people in Vietnam, we have in, uh, people in um, Western uh, United States and finding a right time for everyone is impossible. So when you record a session and you make it available for uh, people to check out later, at least someone who missed it can come back and check out later. Um, then uh, last couple of days, we've seen a few mentions of uh, email notifications uh, where if someone come, uh, something comes into your uh, inbox, you're more likely to check it out than, for example, log in to DHS2 to check the analytics, right? It's similar here. Like if you have a weekly meeting, someone might not come in, but like if you send a newsletter notifying them of something, they're more likely to hear about, hear about it and learn something new from it. Uh, then there's also blog po uh, posts. Uh, we don't do a lot of those, but you know uh, we've done a few. Um, the white papers and type of posts that uh, do more broad or you know more specific information sharing so that people can learn something additional from there. So um, what is the key to success? You know, it's our experience, of course, from uh, our use case, but uh, some of the findings that we have is that it's really important to define uh, what the goal is. In our case, for example, the uh, data exchange implementers community, our goal is to make sure that the partners and the agencies are able to get their data efficiently into DATIM, which is a DHIS2 system. It is complex. You know, we have a lot of metadata, for example, that to deal with. And our exchange is not one way. We do expect data from partners, but in order for them to send the data to us, we need to make sure that all the tools they need are available to them, such as metadata, so that what they're sending us matches uh, you know, what we expect. Um, who is the audience? The, the data use community is more broad. Anyone can join it. You know, Of course, we don't force anyone to join, but we would want to have people who are um, experts in domain come and present and share their information. We also want to make sure that people who would benefit from uh, what is being discussed be present. So um, once you have identified, you know, you, who is your audience and what is the goal, it makes it a lot uh, uh, easier to make it productive. And then uh, in our case, having a regular meetings, even if you don't have, for example, like every second Tuesday of the month, uh, having some kind of regular cadence where you have it so that people expect it, so that uh, if you have to change it, then at least you let people know ahead of time that, you know, they have to make time for your meeting, uh, whether it's a webinar or just community meeting or something so that they can come to it. And then co collaborative tools like online uh, note taking, for example, in our case has been a success where uh, they come in, they sign in, uh, they put in their questions in this sort of uh, wiki style page uh, where we also take notes along the way. And then once the meeting is over, we post the recording of the session on the same page where it's a hierarchical um, structure where you can go back and see. Uh, this community has been going on for eight years and uh, you can go back and check notes and the recordings from I know, like seven years ago and like sometimes like what did I sound like seven years ago? It's like, I'd probably don't want to go back there, but so uh, really that's uh, the highlights that I wanted to bring up. But uh, the conclusion is that, you know, it takes time and effort, you know, it got, doesn't come easy. Uh, you need to be dedicated to the process and just keep on doing it. And really uh, it's going to bring the success and uh, build it out. All right. That's really it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Vlad, and uh, thanks to Sean also for the presentation from Sri Lanka. Um, what I liked about both those presentations was also that I think you saw some really practical advice and this larger perspective on what a community practice is. I think from the DHS2 HISP Center perspective, when we talk about it, we're primarily talking about our community practice website or web forum. But that is not the entirety of the DHS2 community practice, in, in which there are many other smaller communities of practice, people working on a certain project or in a certain aspect of what DHS2 is. And so thinking also outside of the web uh, embodiment of the community practice, that it, it's a larger term, I think is really a useful reminder. In our presentation, we'll be talking a little bit more specifically, I think about our uh, community practice web forums, since that's our primary way of engaging with the global community, um, but definitely good to keep in mind.
So I just need a second to set that presentation up. And we'll be joined by our community practice coordinator, Al Ghassim from Yemen. One day in person. <laughs> Thank you. And I... One second. Just making sure you can hear me. Uh, yes, I'm going to put you on screen in just a second if I can. Um, one also wondering is, um, yeah, well, it's being recorded so that the audio is also going to be on the video, right? Thank you. Thanks. Okay, let me see if I can. Okay, hi, there we go. I think you can get started. Yeah, thank you. Um, hi everyone, my name is Ghassam Sharifuddin. I am from Sana'a Yemen, uh, the Chaisu Community Practice Coordinator. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy to present to you today. Uh, we'll be, we're going to be talking, Max and I are going to be talking about uh, the COP, Community Practice, uh, which you go to community.dhisu.org, that form, online form. And the, the title of the presentation is A Global Community for All. And I want to put an emphasis on the words global and all, um, because those two are very important aspects of this online forum. Uh, when I say all it means everyone, we, we try our best to include everyone in the community. We want everyone to get involved. Everyone has a, there's a voice for everyone to post about their experiences and share their stories. Um, so if we go to the next slide, you can see that there is, um, about 95 countries in the community of practice. Uh, these 95 countries are like where we have members from these 95 countries. And, um, but we have visitors from all, all around the world. And uh, in this table here, you have like the, the top countries with more than 100 plus members. Um, there are a couple that are close to 100, but I included only the more 100 plus members. And the idea of having the community as a global online form that is accessible, accessible for all is that this is basically the, when you go to the community of practice, it's a reflection of the DHIS2 project as a whole. It's a global, you have people sharing implementations from all over the world and from different countries, dif different use cases. And in the, in the long run, in the process itself, uh, this exchange of knowledge and experiences and user stories, the diversity, uh, helps with with growth, helps with learning from each other, and it also helps with getting feedback. Uh, when you get feedback from the different countries who might have tried an implementation that you're working on, uh, I think at the global scale, this this uh, is a reflection of what's actually happening in the DHIS2 project. So that's the purpose of having the community practice uh, online and accessible for everyone around the world. Uh, and it's great to see that diversity. It's great to see uh, so many countries that uh, some of the countries they uh, two years ago maybe there were fewer numbers and and they're joining more members joining and I think that's also a reflection of how the COP is global and local so at the local level and um, uh, we can move to the next slide where we can um, and uh, yeah j just back to the local uh, to the global you can see the COP monthly map and that map, if, if you go back to the slide before that, that map um, is, a, is a part of a monthly post where we tag people from uh, different countries that have been helpful and active in the COP. And so you can see in that map, it's like there is this diversity. We have sometimes people active from different regions at, at, in a month. Um, and these, so now go to the local, uh, yeah. So these members, uh, are helpful at the global scale and it's also helpful for a local level local level could be the individual the person who's for example um in the discussion forum the online academy they want to talk about the course they join the discussions 
or they want to share about specific use cases. Um, those can be like very local at the same time, but they're learning about uh, learning about these things and maybe they face a technical issue that's not really a, a global issue, right? It's just a technical issue for that person, but it gets resolved and support from, from the community. Um, if, uh, the, if you're speaking different languages, we have a couple of, of subcategories for different language communities. Um, it, once the language community grows, we can create that subcategory for, it's also customizable, so we can add more category, subcategories for that. Um, so, like I said, also the support for local level, and uh, there are subcategories like the development category where developers can share about the apps that they're developing and learning from each other, like API wikis and stuff. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. I need to speak really fast uh, because, you know, the, the presentation is really short, but like I said, these active members in the community, they're really active with love. Uh, they voluntarily help each other uh, we, where we tag them on the monthly post and thank them for finding bug issues, uh, requesting feature requests, or supporting each other, re replying to the issues uh, they face. Um, and they voluntarily uh, speak in the end of year events. Um, the recurring activity, you can see this COP activity winner badge is awarded 227 times to 92 members. And uh, there also we have the developer group is uh, I can you know say they're really recognizable in their activity and the COP as well uh, awarded 252 times uh, for 93 developers. Um, and an example of that we sent a request to all the helpful community members and we received a very nice video submission talking about the community. It's a one minute video. Um, I wish we can uh, play that video. Um, so it's in the next slide. It's just a screenshot. Yeah, here we go. Now, yes. Sorry, I just started playing, but I can play it now if you want. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Here we go. We can't hear. The new DSL yeah. two application is ready to go live. Yes. Maybe we could share it with the community. It might be interesting for, for other people. What do you think? I'm new here and I don't know about that. Let me show it to you quickly. The first thing you need to do is to log into the Delta Institute community and then you will find all sorts of topics to read about. You can also ask for help, check out the latest announcement and do you know there's which is the best part? That the people are amazing. They are super helpful, super kind. And yeah, personally, I've learned a lot of details too, thanks to this awesome community. I'm going to check it out. Thank you, Max. So yeah, this is an example of, of how community members really are sharing with love and um, uh, being passionate about the, the idea of community and uh, supporting each other as well. Um, and I, I have been talking about the community practice. If we go to the second next slide after this one. Oh, sorry. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so the second, yes, over here. So uh, before that, I think. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 this one. So uh, before I start talking about building community practice from my perspective, and uh, what have we've seen here, another uh, most very helpful uh, aspect of the COP is that with all this sharing, we have now the biggest DHS to knowledge base there is. Uh, the topic posts go back to like more before the, the team's mailing list before 2018 and Right now, you can see this number of topics and posts. So this is a, a really big knowledge base where you can also, because of this online form, you can tag posts, you can uh, filter them, you can search through them. And it has been helpful for an, uh, for an AI tool uh, in the developers portal where it searches this form and finds information. Um, next slide, please. So uh, in addition to, to that, you know, being open, accessible, a great advantage is also close to the DHIS2 global software team where it integrates with the workspace. They can see the posts in the workspace. It connects, we help connect to the community to the JIRA where 
there is a voting tool and uh, uh, they help with the with the with the roadmap, the software roadmap, as they vote for features or suggest features. So I kind of like uh, Lena in the quality assurance team. She doesn't like it when a lot of open bugs are there, and I push the community to open more bugs. So it's a seesaw there, but um, but I, I try to like tell them like provide the use case and more explanation details. Um, almost all DHI to software members in the COP, uh, are in the COP. So next slide, please. Okay, so the COP is my second home. I have lived in the COP for about three years now and maybe a couple more months. And um, I never use photo as a background in a presentation, but I, I chose this one because I really wanna illustrate how, like, how much I've, I've benefited personally from the COP. And I need to tell you that if you're building a community practice, you really need to embrace it. You need to be there. You need to be present. And I think that helped me when I, when, uh, in my experience, is really having COP as my second home. And I'll explain to you some points now in the next slides. So the most important mindset, uh, the most important mindset when you deal with a community practice is if you click one, just one click. Community is not a help desk. I moved from, from when I first started COP coordinator, I'm like, okay, I need to support people. Yes, you need to support people. You need to be helpful. You need to be there. But the most important mindset I also learned from, from the team, from Max, from conversations with Carolina, from the different uh, discussions and meetings we had, it's, we're not supposed to have that mindset. We're like, it's a help desk. It's not. Uh, we eventually, right now, I can tell you, we have moved from from we have moved from me trying to say, okay, uh, I'm trying to support to I see helpful community uh, members supporting each other. And I, I think that's a very important thing. Keep that in mind. Uh, the mindset in COP is community members supporting each other. Um, yes, you can be helpful, but it's not a help desk. Um, next slide, please. So COP is about, yes, team effort. That's one community effort but you reap what you sow. If you put that environment where you can highlight uh, people's contributions, their members, you, you're gonna get helpful community uh, members. Uh, not all, one of the team members said, not all uh, heroes wear capes, but in, in the community practice, you'll find people who are heroes, who like to contribute, who are very helpful. Just make sure to highly encourage that activity, uh, keep going, review, organize it, uh, you know, don't stop at one thing, try to experiment different things. You can see here in the slide, we, we tried a bunch of things like invitation links weren't really, really utilized and over the long run, we learned how to use them and, and make them very helpful in directing users. Um, we tried, you know, uh, discussion forms and that's working um, with, the, with the digital courses. Uh, one thing that we tried and, and it really wasn't really active for a whole year was a chat room in the COP, so we closed down. Um, but it means, you know, we got to keep trying. Uh, I can talk for forever about this and how many things we do, but I tried to give you the most important things in terms of mindset and shifting the paradigm from a help desk into a community that helps with the growth of your project and some of the most important things you can do. Um, you can follow up or ask me questions anytime. Maybe next slide. I think it's Max's turn. Sure. Yeah, thanks a lot, Augustine. That was a great uh, overview. And um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the um, origins of how we got to the COP and a bit more about strategic direction. So uh, Augustine is our community coordinator, and he works with me. And my role as the lead for the DHS2 training and communications team is to set the strategic direction and work with the team to make sure that we are meeting our goals. And so we work really collaboratively together on what the COP is, what our vision for it is, and whether we're achieving our goals in that vision. So the COP came about in its current form back in 2018. Previously, we had a mailing list, which a lot of people were active on, uh, and that was successful in a lot of ways, but it wasn't really scaling in the global way that we needed it to be, to be searchable, to be browsable, to be translatable. Uh, there are a lot of benefits to moving to a, a more permanent and established web-based platform. So you can see some gaps here we thought we could fill with the COP and um, some of the purposes we thought that uh, it was going to have, make it easier to ask for help and support, 
help people to stop reinventing the wheel, um, be a sort of knowledge base and a, a living forum where people discuss use cases and problems, give feedback. Also, as Gassim mentioned, to contribute to the roadmap, we've now used it pretty dynamically in that respect and more. So there's this whole set of benefits that we saw to moving to a web-based platform, like the discourse platform we used for the DHS2 uh, COP. And we did import around 10 years of discussion from the email list when we started that up. So you can go all the way back to, I think, 2009 or earlier and look for what people were talking about way back in the early days of DHS2, which is really interesting for historical purposes too. Um, but I will say that when I took over this project in 2019, um, the DHS2 COP had been launched, but it was not totally successful yet. And uh, I think there were some things that people noticed in the community that were barriers for us. Uh, and particularly worrying was, A, that some people actually thought the mailing list worked better. So there were a lot of people who were reluctant to embrace the web platform. And even more so, uh, there was this perception that you could ask a question in the COP and nobody would ever answer it. And that's a bad perception because once that becomes the narrative about the platform, then people stop using it. Because what is the point of posting a question if you don't think anyone's gonna look at it? Um, so we had to really turn that around in order for the COP to be a success. And so how do we do that? Because I think now the expectation is totally different. Now I think people see the COP, they see questions being answered, people are stepping up and answering each other's questions, which is exactly where we wanted to be. Um, and the first step to getting there was hiring a person to coordinate the COP. Uh, I think anyone who's managed projects before knows that the people are the most important part of your project. So having the right person in that role was absolutely essential to making the COP a success. And so we hired Agassim to do that job for us. And what I was looking for in filling that role was somebody who is outgoing, someone who is dedicated, motivated by the idea of community and has some technical expertise with DHS2 so they can actually do the, the first level of support if they need to. Um, but as you can see here in the second point, uh, the idea was never to make this a help desk. So we established service standards, and I think this was a key part of, of achieving that perception, was that the idea that if you post a question, it will be answered. But in discussing Augustine's role with him, it was very clear that your role is not to answer every question. Your role is to make sure that every question gets an answer. And that's a very important difference in making the community a living community and not a help desk is we want other people to also participate in those discussions and participate in answering those questions. Um, and then to keep the COP growing, I think we know that if you have an average distribution of COP members, some of them will be very active, some of them will be casual, some of them will be browsers. In order to get a critical mass of very active users, you just need to grow your audience. So part of the strategy was also continuing to make the COP bigger and bigger. And to do that, we incorporated it into mostly all of our activities. So all of our communications activities, all of our training activities, any place we saw a spot where we could connect the COP to it and have a, a, a call to action for people to join the COP, we did that. And so now when you go through most of our, our HISP organized DHX2 activities, you'll see some sort of encouragement for people to join the COP or to post in the COP or to engage it in some way. And that's a deliberate strategy on our part to make that a core part of our operations. So we continue raising the visibility of it and we continue encouraging people to join it and, and be an active part of it. And so I think that's helped us to get from around a couple thousand uh, active members we had back in 2019 to around uh, 8,500 that we have now. And we see regular growth month over month. So I think we're on the right track as, as we continue to broaden the, the use of that and the geographical distribution and the language distribution. We see more use by French speakers, Arabic speakers and others. So I think we're heading in the right direction there. And we also use metrics pretty extensively to review our progress. Um, Gassim has done some good work with queries so he can pull a query of which posts have been our awaiting response. We know on any given day, there are this many posts that we need to look at. So really using data in a smart way, I think, to guide your, your actions and make sure you're on track for your goals has been an essential part of our process too. Uh, so there's still work to do. Um, we know that communities also need work to not just be built, but to continue growing and to, to be maintained. So we're very actively engaged in this. And part of that is also continuing to look back at what we've done to make sure we're, on the, we're doing the right thing to make sure we're taking advantage of new technologies. Um, we're looking right now at our onboarding process. So the process in which new users arrive at the COP, what happens next, making sure that that's, um, you know, working working for the different audiences we're reaching out to and the different ways we're getting users into the COP, whether they're just arriving at the website, whether they're arriving through one of our academy discussion forums or some other process to make sure that each of those user groups 
has a sort of understandable flow to get them into the community so they understand what it is and how they can engage with it. Um, looking at automating some of our workflows. So we do a lot of badge uh, granting and some of those can be automated. For example, if they're through our online academy, if we want to grant someone a badge for finishing a course, it's much more effective if we can do that automatically. So looking at the APIs for our online uh, academy platform and for the discourse forum and trying to make those into a, a sort of scripted workflow that also saves August same some time. Um, and then continue to work with the core DHS2 team and the HISP groups, making sure they're engaged and trying to encourage that through things like integrating uh, Slack and discourse, as Augustine mentioned. Um, and then, you know, as we, as we talked about, the COP becoming part of our live events. So this year we made the COP the real digital home to the annual conference. And we've been doing a lot of work to get online participants to engage with the conference through that way, and also to share people's abstracts and other material about the conference on the COP. So it really becomes a key resource for people who want to learn about the event and engage with the event. Um, so that's a bit about what we've done sort of from a strategic level, operational level to, to build our COP and try to make it successful. Um, and, you know, I think for us, it's really also about like thanking the community and, and recognizing the community, because obviously we can do as much work as we want with our web platform, but if people aren't willing to be part of it or aren't interested in engaging with each other through it, then we don't have a community. So it's really all about the people who are out there in the world using DHS2 who want to engage with each other and want to share with each other and be part of this open source uh, project. So thanks to all of you more than anything else. And I think we are just at time. If anyone has a really burning question they want to ask, otherwise, yes. Oh, sorry, we need to. Yep. Uh, good day, everyone. So um, I wanted to speak with respect to the resources component of it um, in terms of making it work. So there is a, a coordinator. You said getting a coordinator actually helps a lot. But besides the coordinator itself, um, how do you keep the practice going? I know there is the element where you need to, you, you, the persons, the members in the group really would keep it engaged and so. But besides a coordinator from the end, in terms of setting it up and making sure it runs properly, making sure you engage with um, other events and different things, what um, other resources you need besides a coordinator? Um, even in terms of whether there be some specific technical skills or experts. Mm. So I think it depends a bit about which platform you want to use for your community or platforms. As Vlad mentioned, there are also things you can do like email or collaborative notes documents that are also part of this, especially if you're working with a specific project. Um, for our forum, we uh, use an open source product called Discourse, which is the technology the COP is built on. And we pay a yearly... Um, hosting fee for that, which is fairly low, um, but it's probably a few thousand dollars a year to host the actual platform. Um, so those kind of costs, also newsletter platforms have a, have a low cost if you want to use that to send out emails to a mailing list. So there are some technology costs that are there that need to be paid um, depending on the scale of your program. I think there are free alternatives if it's a very small scale, but once you get into thousands of users, you typically have some sort of technology cost that's part of it. Um, and then I think the idea about routine activities is a key operational part of it. So having um, ways in which you encourage this routine engagement with the community, uh, whether that's scheduling meetings, whether it's scheduling meetups, or whether it's having a, a newsletter that goes out every month or every quarter, uh, we do a monthly COP post. Um, so that's less of a, a dollar kind of resource and more just a, a sort of operational planning um, and engagement that has to be done in order to make it, I think, a long-term sustainable project. One last question before we change over. Thank you. I think it's a very friendly community. And I, but I see a lot of posts where someone says, I installed DHS2 and it is not working. And maybe then a screenshot of a, a blank browser page or maybe some errors. And then Al Ghassim will very patiently say, well, what version is this? What are you actually trying to do? Where did the error occur? And other communities are more exacting. They will say, well, here is how to ask a good 
question. Is this a deliberate approach to take a, a more sort of easygoing approach? I think so. So I think we we do have a, uh, an example post on the forum that we would direct people to in the welcome onboarding process. We say, here's an example of a good kind of support post. And we know that not everyone reads that or remembers. You know, people are in that case are coming to the COP because they have an urgent problem. They are trying to make something work and it's not working for them. And so rather than be the kind of stern teacher that says, oh, you didn't ask you a question in the correct format, like we want to help them with their problem. You know, we want the community to help them with their problem. So I think that's the deliberate goal is to be welcoming to people who are coming from all sorts of backgrounds, all sorts of experience levels and focus on getting to the solution and not necessarily the format through which we get to the solution. Um, and part of what Kasim does, which I think is really great, is help people walk through that process of getting to the right question so that the community can help answer it. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think that's all we have time for because we do have another presentation uh, coming up in the same room. We're going to switch to a totally different topic, which is the uh, aggregate data exchange with Global Fund. And, uh, but I think thanks to all of you for coming for this community practice session. I hope it was interesting. And I hope you stay along for this next one too. Thanks. <laughs>